going live any second now. members we're, we're now live okay thank you thank you very much um right good morning uh to members officers and any members of the public who are viewing the, the live stream this morning uh welcome to this meeting of south cambridgeshire district council cabinet um my name is bridget smith councillor bridget smith and i'm the leader of the district council and the chair of cabinet i'm in my kitchen because it's the only warm room in my house uh, so the, for the information of members of the public, uh, the cabinet, which is made up of myself and eight lead cabinet members, is responsible for most of the council services, uh, such as preparing the budget and the council's major policies and strategies for consideration by full council, which is made up of all the district council elected members. So as usual, we'll start off with a few housekeeping announcements. Um, please make sure that your device is fully charged uh, that your microphones are on mute unless you are invited to speak. And when you are invited to speak, please unmute your microphone. Uh, when you finish speaking, please then turn it off straight away. If you could speak slowly and clearly and don't talk over or interrupt anybody else because that makes it impossible to understand what's going on. And could you switch off or silence any other devices you have so that they don't interrupt the proceedings? So the normal procedure at Cabinet is to take votes by affirmation and we will continue with this tradition. When we move to the vote on any item, I'll ask if members agree with the proposal and if any member wants to either vote against the proposal or abstain, then we'll take a roll call of all members of Cabinet. Um, I'll then ask each member to speak into the microphone so their vote is clear both to Cabinet and to those of you who are watching and members should respond for against or abstain when their name is called, please. So there's business on this agenda, uh, which is confidential, and this is re referred to as exempt business. And if the committee agrees to exclude the press and public at item 12 on this agenda, the live video stream will end um, and I'll let members of the public know when this is about to happen. So cabinet members present, um, I'll now invite each of you to introduce yourselves and members, after I call your name, please turn on your microphone, say your name and your lead cabinet role so that your presence can be noted and uh, members of the public um, can see who you are. So if we start off with uh, Councillor Aidan van der Weyer. Uh, yeah. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Aidan van der Weyer. I'm the lead member for Strategic Planning and Transport and the Deputy Leader. Thank you, Aidan. Uh, Councillor Neil Goff. Good morning, I'm Neil Goff. I'm the uh, Deputy Leader. Thank you. Councillor Bill Handley. Good morning, uh, Bill Handley. I'm the lead member for Community Resilience, Health and Wellbeing. And that's quite a new new cabinet position. Uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Toomey Hawkins and I'm the lead cabinet member for planning. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter MacDonald. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Peter MacDonald and the lead cabinet member for business recovery and skills. Thank you. And that's another another fairly new cabinet responsibility. Uh, Councillor Brian Milnes. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Brian Milnes and I'm the lead member for environmental services and licensing and member for Sawston. Thank you very much. Councillor Hazel Smith. Good morning. Uh, I'm the lead cabinet member for housing. Thank you. And finally, Councillor John Williams. Good morning. I'm John Williams. I'm the lead cabinet member for finance. Thank you, busy man. Uh, so I can confirm that the meeting is is for it. Uh, so um, we've got Councillor Grenville Chamberlain present, I believe, at the Chair of Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Could, would you like to say hello? Good morning, Grenville Chamberlain, Chair of the Scrutiny Committee. Nice to see you all. 
Thank you. Lovely to see you as well and, and your deputy. So are there any non-Cabinet members present uh, this meeting? If you could just kind of take it in turns to uh, say hello. Difficult to take it in terms if we don't know if anyone else, else is speaking. I'm just, Councillor Douglas De Lacey. I'm the Chairman of the Council. Hello, Councillor De Lacey. Welcome. And following on from Douglas, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, the Vice Chairman of the Council. I'm Anna Bradner, member for Milton and Waterbeach. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Judith Ripper, member for Milton and Waterbeach. You just referenced me as um, Grenville's Deputy Vice Chair of Scrutiny and Overview. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Claire Daunton. I'm one of the members for the Fendit and, and Fullborn Ward. Thank you very much, Councillor Daunton. Hello, I'm Councillor Ellington from Swavesea Ward. Thank you very much, Councillor Ellington. Good morning, I'm Bunty Waters from the Bar Hill Ward. Thank you and good good morning. Nice nice to see you. Um, right here, is that everybody? Uh, well, I'm, I'm here. I'm hello, hi, hello. Uh, Richard Williams, a member for the Whittlesford Ward. Yeah. Hello, Councillor Williams. And Councillor Jeff Harvey, I'm the member for Borsham. Thank you. Oh, so that's a good good turnout. Thank you very much for giving up your morning to join us. Is that everybody? Lovely. Right. OK, so moving on. Um, so we have uh, we have various officers uh, present. Uh, officers are going to keep their cameras off unless uh, we call on them. Uh, but our chief executive, Liz Watts, is present. Um, our head of finance, our director of planning and our, our monitoring officer and various members of democratic services without whom these meetings would not happen and uh, to whom we're very grateful. Uh, so moving on, um, are there any apologies for absence? Jonathan, please. Thank you, Leader. We've received no apologies for absence. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed. If anybody hasn't got their um, uh, their, their mute on, could they please uh, do that? And um, coming on to declarations of interest. So, do any members have any interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? Um, but if an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, uh, could you please raise it at that point? Um, Leader, if I could uh, declare an interest as um, a member of the Investment Partnerships Board. So that's Councillor Peter MacDonald declaring an interest as a member of the Investment Partnership Board. If that could be noted in the minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so coming on to the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, which start at page one and run to page six. Um, I think Councillor um, Douglas De Lacey has indicated that he would like to uh, say something on the minutes. I'm just going to ask, is there any cabinet member wants to speak on the minutes before I bring in Councillor De Lacey? Uh, yes, thank you, Leader. Thank um, you. It's, it's regarding um, point 10. Um, unfortunately, there seem to have been some um, problems with cut and paste on that particular uh, minute. So I'd like to uh, read out an amendment, please. Thank you. Um, and it's uh, to do with um, the second line um, to uh, remove after um, noted um, and to replace with this was about an underspend in some of the council services which was identified but there was a small overspend in finance and corporate services related to additional resources and in facilities to help with COVID-19 related issues. We have also supported the community and businesses through the crisis and it is not clear yet if the government grant will cover the costs to the general fund. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Williams. Does anybody want to comment on that correction that Councillor Williams has clarified? No? OK, if I could bring in uh, Councillor De Lacey now. Thank you very much, Leader. Uh, a very small comment uh, under the uh, attendances. Uh, if I am to be graced with my doctorate and Dr Claire Daunton with hers, I think Dr Richard Williams ought to have his as well. Um, 
Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, a more substantive point is on item eight on page two. Um, I think uh, whoever was taking notes didn't quite understand what I was saying. And at the minute at the moment reads, the chair of the council, Councillor Douglas de Lacey, was pleased with the detail within each indicator. Uh, what I was pleased with was the promise of more detail within each indicator, specifically the uh, contact centre. Um, I didn't hope that there would be comments with all indicators. I was just surprised that there wasn't a congratulatory comment on the contact centre. Um, Liz Watts pointed out that we didn't congratulate ourselves and I think that could simply be removed. OK, so Jonathan, are you happy to make those amendments, please? Uh, yes, Leda. Thank you. And does that, would anybody like to comment on the correction that Councillor de Lacey has made? Otherwise, I'm happy to accept it. No. OK, right. I'll just um, I'll just go through page by page. If there's anything further on page one, page two, page three, page four or page five. No. Nope. OK, fine. So um, I move the approval of uh, these minutes as a correct record. Um, Councillor van der Weyer, I believe you're going to second this. Would you confirm that? Uh, yes, I would like to second it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, uh, do members agree to approve the, mi the minutes? Agreed. Agreed. Does anyone wish to vote against the proposal? Uh, Leader, I will abstain since I wasn't present for the meeting. Thank you very much. So, that's Councillor Neil Goff will be abstaining because he wasn't present. Okay. So, ca Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation with one abstention. Righty ho. So moving on to 4B uh, was a written answer related to minute nine of the previous meeting. Um, so we now that is present in the papers. Cabinet's asked to note these responses. Uh, cabinet happy to do so? Yep. Great. OK, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so moving on to public questions and we've got two public questions. Uh, welcome both to Mrs Jane Williams and to Mr Daniel Fulton. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to come and ask questions of us in person. Um, uh, Mrs Williams, would you like to ask your questions and Councillor John Williams is going to uh, respond to you. Thank you and good morning. Chair and cabinet um, and councillors. Um, I'm speaking as a resident of South Cams. Um, and my question is at any time during this calendar year, have any funds been transferred from the collection fund to any other account of the district council? Or have any funds from the collection fund been used for any expenditure by or on behalf of the district council? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Williams. Um, Mr. John Williams, would you like to respond to this, please? Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I have to say that we weren't entirely clear um, about uh, what what the purpose of the question was. And I know that our head of finance did <clears throat> uh, attempt to contact uh, Mrs. Williams, but um, wasn't successful. So I will answer the question. Um, but Mrs Williams may like to come back and explain exactly what her question is about. So in, in answer to the question that was put, each financial year an amount is transferred from the collection fund to the general fund that is equal to the value of the district council precept and the total of all parish council precepts. This amount is fixed when the budget for that year is set in February of the preceding financial year. The amount of the district precept is used to fund district council expenditure and the amount transferred in relation to parish councils is used to pay their parish precepts. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Millis. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Jane Williams, would you like to come back with a supplementary question or some or an, a further explanation of your original question? Um, well, I would just like to say, um, how, is there anything in the public domain 
that would say whether or not, I mean, it, the question is, um, at any time during this calendar year, have any funds been transferred other than perhaps um, the ones that Councillor Williams has referred to, as it's not possible to see the accounts. OK, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Williams. Um, no, I, I, I think I need to explain what the collection fund is. We, we are the billing authority, which means that we have the task of sending the bill to um, the council taxpayer on behalf of all those who can set precepts. So the council taxpayer receives one bill and then we receive all that money in to what we call a collection fund. And then we take out of that collection fund what we have precepted and we take out of that collection fund what the parish councils have precepted so that we can pay them their money. So there is no other reason why we would take money out of that collection fund because what's left in it is there for the other precepting authorities like the county council, the fire and the police. So I do hope that explains, you know, the workings of the collection fund. Um, you know, we take out of the collection fund what we have asked our council taxpayers to pay for South Cam's services in their council tax. And similarly, we take out what the parish councils have asked their uh, parishioners to pay for their services. And, and that's, that's it. Thank you very um, much. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Williams. You've um, confirmed that. I think this is what you're saying, that it's only just been the, the usual. Um, I have read up about it and have been looking at it, but it is just actual the usual precept monies that have come in and gone out as as council would normally do. That's what you're telling me, yes? Yes. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mrs. Mrs. Williams. Uh, right, moving on to uh, Mr. Daniel Fulton. Um, hello, Mr. Fulton. Would you like to uh, put your question, please? Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. The council recently announced that it will be contributing 170 million pounds over the next four years towards new development partnerships with the Hill Group and Balfour Beatty. The council's announcement also stated that, quote, identifying suitable land opportunities will be a core element of work by the partnerships and the target sites are located within South Cambridgeshire. Could the leader of the council please identify the parishes in which these target sites are located? And does the leader of the council foresee any potential conflicts of interest that could arise as a result of the council's dual role as a profit making land developer and its statutory duties for plan making and development management as the district's local planning authority? Thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. So, uh, so you've directed that question to me, so I'll answer it. Uh, so the investment partnerships are in their very, very early stages of development. And in fact, initial meetings with partners are just taking place this, this month. So any potential sites would be discussed by the council's investment governing board members before any further appraisal work was undertaken. Um, in terms of conflict of interest, the investment strategy is clear, and I'm sure you've looked at that investment strategy, which is a public document. So the potential for any conflicts of interest to arise is one that um, we take really seriously. And as a result, we have thought in great detail about the decision making and advisory approach to be taken with regard to the investment partnerships. We've also taken, as we always do, legal advice and considered best practice from elsewhere where similar models have been introduced. And, you know, this isn't a this isn't a new model. Therefore, at this point, whilst we've taken steps to avoid any conflicts of interest arising, we would always be vigilant in this regard. And we believe that those involved in the process are fully aware of their obligations and will seek further advice if at any point they, we or I believe it is required. So, um, do you have a supplementary, Mr. Fulton? Um, I do. Um, my concern is that the council is basically attempting to monetize its its its, its regulatory function as local planning authority, and um, I'd also be concerned um, that if the council is going to become a for-profit land developer, 
it could al also potentially leverage this to give it a competitive advantage over other local developers who are not the local planning authority. Um, have these concerns been given any consideration at all? Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so so the answer is yes, of course, we've given consideration, but it's quite a complex question. So if you would forgive me, I would rather take it away because I think if I, I, I don't think I should be answering a complex question like that just on the hoof. So I would rather take it away and give you a written response that will appear uh, which you will get as soon as possible it will appear in the in the uh, minutes just to make sure that you get a completely full full response to this, which will hopefully give you the reassurance that you're looking for. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your answer and for the opportunity to ask the question today. You're, you're very welcome. We look forward to seeing you again. Yeah. Righty ho. So moving moving on um, to uh, issues arising from scrutiny and overview committee. So Councillor Chamberlain, do you wish to speak at this point? Uh, thank you, Leader. If I may, I think it would be more appropriate for me to speak um, as each item comes before Cabinet. Thank that's you. that's fine. OK, um, yeah, super. We shall do that. So and uh, I think the main issue is the one that's now coming up. So compulsory purchase report. Uh, so uh, could I ask this is item seven, uh, which is on page nine. So I'm going to ask Councillor John Williams to introduce the report and move the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor John Williams. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Scrutiny and Overview Committee for their constructive comments on the proposed compulsory purchase or the policy. It, it has not been possible to take all the suggestions on board, but all the points made were considered to produce this final version. And I would like to add, that um, it will also include um, um, guidance on um, an exit strategy for um, for um, compulsory purchase uh, powers, but that is still in the process of being um, worked out. But will be included in the in the final version of the um, of the document. As I said at scrutiny and overview. I think it's right for us to be open about in what circumstances we may seek compulsory purchase orders. Um, and this compulsory purchase order policy explains the approach, circumstances and conditions for using compulsory purchase powers. To make it clear, at this moment in time, we have no plans to use compulsory purchase powers. This report before you is purely to establish a policy framework which is clear and transparent to the ordinary person. And for that reason, it is balanced in its approach to provide meaningful information without going into an enormous amount of detail. Its purpose is not to advocate other policies of this council. The proposed policy recognises that compulsory purchase powers should be a last resort and provides a clear understanding of the general approach to be adopted. What level of compensation, if any, that might be offered and the practical guidance and support that this council can provide to those affected. This council has threatened to use compulsory purchase powers in the past. This was used in Fullbourne to unblock an impasse with the Swift's housing development to deliver meaningful negotiations. But the approach and mechanism for doing it was ad hoc and unclear as the council had no policy framework to work within. Also, we have been asked to use a compulsory purchase order to acquire the tree in Stapleford, but once again had no CPO policy against which to judge the request. The in introduction to the policy on page 14 of the agenda pack explains that the council will consider compulsory purchase powers to acquire the property for the purpose of carrying out development, redevelopment, or improvement on or in relation to the land so that it promotes or improves the economic, social or environmental well-being of its area. This could range from the provision of social housing to the creation of wildlife habitat. Under the legislative context section, we explain the powers available to us and in what circumstances we can use them. In particular, Town and Country Planning Act 1990 gives us a broad scope, but as paragraph 13 on page 15 of your agenda pack explains, 
We must not exercise our power unless we think that the proposed development, redevelopment or improvement is likely to contribute to achieving the promotion or improvement of the economic, social or environmental well-being of the area for which we have administrative responsibility. The policy then goes on to explain how we will consult and I cannot emphasise enough that our intention is always to seek a voluntary acquisition and how we will make an offer at the market value for its legal use and how that market value is arrived at. The policy also deals with compensation payments for owners and tenants. Finally, the policy also sets the framework for community assets and bringing empty properties in a poor state of repair or derelict back into use where the owner is unlikely to do so and a clear public benefit would be achieved. This could include the provision of affordable housing, improving the appearance of the neighbourhood and reducing crime and antisocial behaviour brought about by dilapidated buildings. The adoption of this compulsory purchase order policy would set minimum standards and a consistent approach to this council using its compulsory powers. So therefore I ask Cabinet to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Williams. And I believe that um, Councillor Hazel Smith is going to um, second this. Um, could I, uh, Hazel, uh, Councillor Smith, do you want to say, say anything at this point before I bring in Councillor Grenville Chamberlain? Uh, yes, bring in, bring in Councillor Chamberlain. Thank you. Um, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, would you like to comment on this, please? Thank you, Leader. Um, we had a very lengthy discussion and we overview and scrutiny committee regarding this and we made uh, as councillor williams has alluded to a number of suggestions which we felt would perhaps um, improve the uh, final policy i'm most grateful to councillor williams for taking those points on board and i do believe that as a result of that uh, we do have a, a, a much improved policy and i thank you thank, thank you very much indeed um, would anybody else like to comment on this if you want to speak, if you could put it in the chat, please, I can pick pick it up. Uh, so I'm I'm going to um, just add a little bit down to the amendment. Uh, sorry, sorry, to the recommendation. Uh, just to add on the end, um, subject to further minor amendments resulting from the scrutiny and overview committee uh, review, report, and I think that picks up. Uh, what Councillor Williams mentioned um, about further work ongoing to put an exit strategy included into the policy. But if we add on subject to further minor amendments resulting from the scrutiny and overview committee review. Is that OK? Have you got that, Jonathan? Is that acceptable to you, Councillor Williams? OK, uh, and to officers, is that all right? Yep, that's fine, Councillor. OK. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, the recommendation is on page nine. Cabinet's requested to consider and if satisfied, approve the compulsory purchase order policy attached to Appendix A as the basis for considering the use of compulsory purchase powers to acquire land or property interests for the purpose of carrying out development, redevelopment or improvement where there is a compelling case in the public interest to do, do so, subject to min, uh, minor amendments resulting from the scrutiny and overview committee review. All right, so do uh, our mem all members um, happy to approve that? Agree. Agree. Uh, does anybody wish to vote against? And would anybody like to abstain? OK, so the Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. Thank you very much. So moving on to uh, what is a hot topic in many committees now, which is the response to the government consultation planning for the future white paper. And let me just. Uh, so that starts on page 23. Uh, so, Councillor Hawkins is going to introduce this report um, and I believe that Councillor van der Weyer is going to, uh, sec going to second it. So, Councillor Hawkins, would you like to start off, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Leader. Um, as we know, the government is proposing to make uh, sweeping changes to the planning system and is currently consulting on those proposals as contained in its planning white paper. 
the report before you today contains the responses that this council proposes to give to that planning white paper. And we're doing this hopefully in conjunction with uh, Cambridge City. Well, firstly, I want to thank officers for the excellent work that has gone into uh, briefing members um, you know, previous weeks and of drafting this report, this response which is very much appreciated. Now, the paper itself focuses on three key things, as we know, planning for development, uh, planning for beautiful and sustainable places, and also planning for infrastructure. I mean, in, in my view, the white paper is proposing the wrong solution to the problem of delivering more houses nationally. Uh, but that's not to say that the planning process itself cannot be improved, but blaming lack of delivery on the planning process is definitely not right. Now, there are some positive aspects of the proposed changes. For example, taking a digital first approach to the process, which is something that we are already doing. And, um, but there's also some very radical changes that we think will be quite problematic, in particular, in relation to infrastructure provision and the infrastructure levy. Uh, for example, you know, who pays what, when, how, and you know, lumbering councils with the responsibility of upfront infrastructure provision, uh, you know, sort of causes serious concerns. Uh, the paper itself is quite light on many details, as you've recognized, uh, that would help us to understand exactly what is proposed and how it will be implemented. The overall tone of the proposals um, also seem to be taking away some of the powers of local councils and local people to influence their areas. And you know, we, we think that this, you know, we should be highlighting this as well. So in the responses in this report, we have tried to be as robust as possible, acknowledging the positives, but also being constructive about the areas where we have serious concerns. So as consultation ends on the 29th of October, uh, we would like the cabinet's views on the draft responses so we can incorporate them um, after discussing and making all the proposed changes with the Joint Director of Planning and to authorize me to sign off the final response. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, so thank you very much to officers who've put considerable work into this. Uh, as Councillor Hawkins said, you know, we've gone to we've gone to huge efforts to try and find something positive uh, to say about uh, these proposals, uh, which is and I've sat in numerous meetings over the last few weeks with the District Council Network, Local Government Association, East of England councils and so on, um, who are, and all of whom have, who have really, really struggled to find anything positive whatsoever to say. And that's been very much a cross party uh, approach. And I think it's been the, the position across the whole country as well. Um, so I think, you know, possibly we've been a bit too kind. Um, I in this the sort of finalising this, I would like uh, Councillor Hawkins with her officers to cross reference this response uh, with the bodies such as the District Council Network and the Local Government Association and the East of England Local Government Association responses, which were all just getting signed off last week. So, you know, people probably haven't seen them to make sure that we are in alignment uh, with those bodies as well. And I think you will probably find that actually they've taken a, a more, uh, they have struggled more than we have to find anything anything good to say. So it's, you know, it's important that we are in align with them. My particular concerns are over um, our responses to SIL. Uh, and I think that we need to look at that again. Um, it's not that the answers are wrong, but I think you know, we're making very sensible suggestions. Uh, but I think our residents, our parish councils are going to be very, very worried at potentially uh, losing their control over particularly Section 106, which has been, is used to such good effect in South, South Cambridgeshire. So um, I think there's a that we just need to do that cross referencing. Uh, but as I say, it's a, it's a terrific bit of work. Um, I'm just going to bring in sort of various cabinet members first. Um, so if uh, Councillor John Williams uh, would like to speak first, then Councillor Aidan van der Waer, and then Councillor Brian Mills, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, and picking up on your point of, regarding question 22, which is to do with SEAL and Section 106, I mean, this ha this will have an enormous impact on our parish councils, um, and we don't reference them at all in our answer. 
So I would like to ensure that we do point out that parish councils rely a great deal on Section 106 payments to deal with the, you know, the local impact of a, of a development. They are the people best placed to understand what those impacts are going to be, and they need to be involved in the negotiations, which they are in, in the Section 106 agreements, whereas under the uh, proposals, they would be excluded from, um, from being able to, to ensure that their local communities on, you know, the impacts on their local communities are properly dealt with and funded. And, you know, this does concern me. I mean, this, this does the opposite to what the um, government was trying to do, you know, only five years ago, and that is to involve local people in developments Whereas this does the complete opposite. This now cuts local people out of deciding on local developments. It's got, to, it, you know, it is a bad thing. It will not go down well in our communities. And I do hope that pressure will be brought by our MPs on the government to get this changed. Thank, thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Van der Weyer. Yep. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, so yes, this is a really excellent um, uh, proposed response. Uh, I think there's some sort of tweaks that we can make as, as we're discussing, um, but but overall it, it really captures, I think, the the uh, some of the really serious implications of this white paper uh, and, and does so in a, in a very clear and understandable way. Um, uh, it, the, as we were saying, the, the loss of community involvement um, and, and it really undermines as well uh, um, our ability uh, to to create the places we, we want, um, uh, to create places that, that meet the needs um, of our area, uh, and also to, to meet the um, ambitions, particularly on uh, climate change, um, carbon emissions, uh, and, and biodiversity in nature. Um, but one of the interesting uh, aspects um, it, that, that is, um, one of the interesting aspects that are being discussed here is about the, this idea of uh, infrastructure levy to replace sealed in Section 106 agreements. Um, and uh, I, I think um, there might be a little bit of change of emphasis that, that um, uh, that's needed. But but overall, um, uh, I, I think the infrastructure levy does have the potential um, to address some of the problems with SIL and S one hundred six, and by building in uh, building in the the the, in the values that are needed um, uh, to provide the infrastructure early on in the process, so that they're sort of included in, in land prices, and we don't have this. These arguments about uh, viability um, and also to um, take into account uh, strategic, strategic issues uh, that are not currently, uh, um, we're not currently able to do through Section 106. Uh, an example given here is about the um, electricity network capacity. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but um, I hope that whatever comes out of this, uh, uh, some sort of reform of Section 106 and SIL um, uh, does uh, um, take into account our, our comments uh, that we, and, and so. Having having set them out um, so clearly, um, uh, I think that would certainly help um, uh, government when they when they're reviewing this um, uh, take our comments seriously. But thank you very much. Thank thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Mills, and then Councillor Smith, please. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to make a couple of points because we've got a very um, constructive and formal approach here, but um, it perhaps doesn't. Um, um, or it isn't isn't the vehicle um, to um, uh, stress the the disconcert uh, amongst the general population that this might give a developer free for all once an area was placed in uh, a growth area area category. Um, and picking up on other points that uh, Councillor Hawkins um, and Williams has has mentioned about the involvement of local. Um, neighbourhood plans, village design guides and uh, contribution. It's not clear uh, where those contributions are going to be able to be made. Um, and then we've also got the whole uh, issue, the repeated um, vision of property technology. Um, but we, we see from uh, re recent events how questionable algorithms can undermine uh, such policy. Um, and we've already seen that the, the current uh, algorithm would deliver um, a smaller housing need than previously calculated. So there's, uh, and as um, Councillor to, to me, Hawkins said, 
you know, there's a whole slew of un unanswered questions in here in, in matters of significant detail, but also over who will be the arbiter of, of quality and beauty and good design, which are all subjective items. And it's not clear at all where uh, those questions will be answered. So I think as, as well as this more formal approach, um, I think we should just be cognizant of those wider issues. And, and clearly this is a politically motivated process that isn't uh, really designed to do what it says it's going to do, which is address um, you know, absorption rates that were uh, you know, clearly um, shown in the Latwin report just a, a year or, or, or so ago. Um, and we, we, we don't have a problem delivering the number of houses. We have a problem with the developers not building out. If we've got a million um, uh, properties that have um, uh, applications approved, and not being built out. There's there's the, the core problem. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Mills. I must say some of the these the questions that were asked. You know, what three words do you associate most with the planning system in England? I mean, yeah, enough said. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Leader. Yes, I agree with everything that's been said. This falls way short of being a sensible discussion of of the problems and the solutions. Um, I can see that um, SIL might be a way or an, a new infrastructure levy might be a way to stop the numbers of affordable homes being squeezed at, in our new developments, which would definitely be a good, a good thing. But talking about beauty, when actually the more important thing is low carbon homes and homes that are fit to live in um, and actually ensuring that um, that we double nature is much more important, I would say. Um, my, my question um, about uh, question 26, we haven't said anything um, about protected characteristics. We have a lot of travellers in our district and their families grow and we do need to find more land for permanent traveller sites. There is nothing in this in this consultation in the, uh, the Green Paper about um, planning for traveller sites and how it fits in with the existing legislation. And I think that does need to come in there under question 26 um, so that it's given some consideration at least. That, thank you. I quite, quite agree, Councillor Smith. Right. Any, anyone else from Cabinet wish to say anything before I bring in um, Councillor de Lacey? OK, right. Councillor de Lacey, would you like to ask your question? Thank you very much, Leader. Um, it seemed to me as I read this that there were two glaring omissions. One is, uh, as has already been said, the problem of things like land banking. And we mentioned it our, in our response, but I think we really need to highlight, uh, as Councillor Hawkins said, this is the wrong answer to the major question. Yes. Uh, and I think we could say a lot more on that. The other was developer profits. Um, I was told in a, um, a briefing in the JDCC uh, firstly, that developers are uh, can expect to have something like a 20% profit on their developments. And this is because of the risk they take. Now, one of the things they say about uh, this new proposal is that it should reduce developer risk. And therefore, I think we ought to challenge them and say, if that is true, then um, we would expect that their profit should be less and that should provide more money for uh, the sort of things we've already talked about. It's a great response. I do uh, congratulate officers, but I think we could try and get uh, more about land banking and something about um, developer profits. I'm also concerned on the uh, replacement of Section 106 and SIL. Uh, we've had one major issue with contaminated land, and we, we mentioned this on page 36 of the report, but uh, I'm left very unclear as to what would happen if a development discovers something like contaminated, uh, contaminated land or unexploded ordnance or something like that. Will this approach mean that the council would be put to huge expense because the developers aren't? I, I'd like us to ask for clarification on that. Um, I've also noted a couple of typos, but I'll email those to John Dixon if I may. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dulacy. Uh, very well made points, which I know Councillor uh, Hawkins and officers will take for forward. Uh, certainly on the issue of risk, 
uh, the district council network response has a lot to say about the fact that the risk now seems to have transferred from the developers to the local authority. And, you know, we cannot we cannot have that um, because, you know, if we don't have the if we get all the risks, but we don't get any of the money to mitigate that risk, then we aren't going to be building great places. Uh, Councillor Anna Bradnam next, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I, I have a two or three points I'd like to ask. One is, um, can I encourage the council uh, to um, acknowledge the fact that it's holding its nose about a lot of this and actually be stronger uh, where you disagree, be clearer where you disagree. You've been very good. You've said yourself that um, the responses are written to try and find ways where we can find every possible thing to agree with. But actually, I don't think it's strong enough on the things that you object to. So I would like to see stronger language there. Um, the other thing, second thing was digital first, whilst I absolutely accept that, have you actually checked with all of the parish councils that they can all handle that? Um, and if they can't, we need to make provision for them and also for individuals who, who may find it more difficult to interact with a digital um, platform. And finally, um, I wanted to urge that the council, uh, you, you mentioned yourself, Leader, that the, we would be cross-referencing with other authorities. Can I urge that you cross-reference with the county council too, um, to make sure that none of those aspects which kind of lurk across our boundaries get missed out because we're not wanting to tread on each other's toes. For example, clearly flooding goes across um, and, and drainage matters. Whilst there, one might think of the county council as being the local flood authority, actually it affects our ability to build houses and which parts of land might be suitable for housing, but also the sufficiency of water to make sure, and that goes across our boundaries too, and, and is driven by the fact that geology is not constrained by administrative boundaries and we need to make sure that we're not um, missing out the, op the opportunity to raise those concerns. Uh, water has been raised just briefly under 13, question 13 on page 25, where it refers to map based documents identifying land in three classifications, growth, renewal and protected. But of course, the aquifer and the geology may cross underneath those um, and also just a um, a kind of along with that making it stronger I'd quite like to see a bit more Anglo-Saxon in there a straight straightforward language uh, with good, good examples um, because sometimes my my initial comment when I read it through is excellent you're cut, touching on the points but it's caught it's it's captured in rather conceptual language and I would like to see it more direct and interestingly at the County Council the Environment and Sustainability Committee is drawing up its own response uh, and it was looked at on the 15th of October and I find their language more um, down to earth and I would like to see our response in that down to earth way as well but thank you very much for doing an excellent response if you can take those points down. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Councillor Badman. So, I mean, ex, ex, excellent um, questions from you. Uh, so, you know, I think the, we've already had a discussion today about the, the fact we're possibly being too polite, and that's a reflection of the fact that we have got lovely, polite, courteous officers. Um, and I think our job is to get some of that Anglo-Saxon in there, because certainly a lot of the meetings I've been in, there's been a lot of Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> lying around, uh, much of which has not been printable on this subject. So obviously we've got to find find a balance balance there. Um, digital first, obviously that's something that we're managing across the board anyway. And you're quite right to highlight uh, we should be referencing the county response, but actually you've reminded me we should also be referencing the combined authority response. And uh, you know what your re your reference to kind of cross-border issues. You know, the government are, are proposing that we take out the duty to cooperate. 
you know, I mean, that is just such a nonsense, particularly somewhere like South Cambridgeshire, where we have so much development and so many uh, propositions that, that go not just across our boundary with Cambridge City, but with Uttlesford, with Huntingdonshire and you know, Bedfordshire and, and so on. So, uh, OK, so I'm, I'm kind of um, stepping on uh, Councillor Hawkins toes here. So I'm going to if there's no one else wants to speak, I'm going to let her come if back. I may, to, if I may say so, just to clarify that, I also meant the boundaries between those classifications of land, growth, renewal and, and protected. The, the, the geology also runs across and beneath those potential different classifications. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to let Councillor Hawkins come in. Thank you very much, Councillor Braddon. Thank you, Lida. I think Councillor Claire Daunton's just put her hand up. Oh, right. That's I haven't seen that. Councillor Daunton, would you like if you could um, indicate on the chat if you'd like to speak, then it's easy for me to see that. So, so Councillor Daunton, please come in before Councillor Hawkins winds up. Um, I just want to um, really confirm what Councillor Bradham has said and direct her remarks to page 46, the response to question 20. Um, and, and really the contradiction in terms between fast tracking and beauty. Beauty is a concept. You can't fast track a concept. And I think that we could be um, more robust and more questioning on that response. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a point well made and we will take that on board. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Lida, and thank you uh, to all the councillors who have um, made comments. Um, well, I appreciate that. I can assure you if I had written this myself, it would uh, be not just Anglo-Saxon, but it will be, um, you know, <coughs> very Nigerian, shall I say, because that is my background. And we do say things very directly. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot in here for us to take in, but I can assure you that uh, we will be doing that. And um, some of the things which um, you know, in, involving local, uh, you know, the parishes, local people, neighbourhood plan, VDGs. You know, these are the things that uh, I think we have sort of discussed in the past uh, and, and which has come up in various um, other discussions. So thank you very much. Um, we will take this away and um, we will make sure that all that you have, um, you know, brought forward are also um, you know, input into the document itself. And um, yeah, definitely we will be um, as Anglo-Saxon as we possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hawkins. You. Uh, so, you know, just to have the last word, uh, I had the fortune or, or misfortune to talk directly to the uh, housing minister last week, uh, where I challenged him about this issue of beauty as actually being meaningless and that we should be talking about housing standards and houses that are fit, fit to live in. Um, and what was very disappointing about the presentation uh, I, I sat in from him was that this is all about getting more houses built more quickly. And his answer to that is to uh, give more leeway for SMEs to build. Now, we, you know, as a council, we are very, very supportive of SMEs, but the reality is that land values in this area are a huge hindrance to SMEs uh, really being able to uh, build as much as they want. So we've got to make sure that we have the freedoms um, and the finances to be able to support our SMEs to start playing a much, uh, much fuller role there. So we've got uh, recommendations on page 23 and it's recommended that Cabinet A note and consider the initial response to the government's white paper um, as set out in Appendix A and B agree to delegate the wording, the uh, Anglo-Saxon wording as we now know, of the final joint response and any individual response with the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development in full consultation with the lead Cabinet member for planning policy and delivery. Uh, so are members in agreement with the proposal? Agreed. Agreed. Anybody wish to vote against? Anyone wish to abstain? Good, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. So uh, moving on to item nine um, on page 55, which is the review of pre-application charging schemes and update on pre-application service. Um, so Councillor Hawkins again in the limelight. Yeah, it's my morning today. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, 
I think what, one of the planks of improving our planning service is the revamp of our pre-application uh, process. I mean, up till now, both South Cams and the city, we've been working on two different, um, you know, charging schedules and uh, processes, um, and we'd like to streamline that. And obviously, the advantages of a, pre a good pre-app service uh, is well known in that the earlier engagement of applicants and developers with the council and the community uh, develop, de delivers the best developments, uh, you know, for all concerned. Now, we do recognize that in the past we have not provided as good a pre-app service as we would like. Um, but we know that if we can get it right this time, then we should see further improvements in the service we provide uh, to our customers. I think once again, I want to thank our officers for the excellent work that has gone um, into putting this document together. Um, you know, there's been, uh, you know, liaison with other councils, you know, you know, uh, of, uh, you know uh, similar other councils, there's lots of uh, discussions with me, with the executive councillor from the city. Um, you know, th thank you for for what you've put together here. Now, the paper before you today outlines the plans and the pricing uh, for the new proposed service, as you see on Appendix One on pages 63 and 64. Now, so this is based on identifying the cost of the work that goes into the pre app that our planners have to do and also working with other de uh, departments whose input is needed. But also we will be looking at using technology um, as appropriate. For example, um, for householder applications, we're thinking about using uh, teams to record the meetings so that that is a, a, um, uh, something that can be used uh, as a record. It does speed up the responses because what, that's one of the things that applicants say that they don't get the uh, you know the, the the final response from us in a timely manner. But as you will see from the table, these costs have also been discounted to what we consider is a level that will make it attractive to use, while still enabling us to recover some costs. Um, but the, I'm sure the question will be asked, um, you know, in terms of uh, people. I mean, we will be supporting our planners. Um, to prioritize pre-app and give them the support that they need to be able to, um, you know, make this a priority. Um, because we recognize that if we can iron out issues with an application at the front end, then it gives confidence to applicants that the application, when it does come in, uh, will pass through the process more smoothly and obviously our planners will have, um, you know, less objections to deal with. We do propose to review this, uh, you know, this revamp process uh, in 12 months to see how it works, you know, so that we can use it to improve our performance and also the service that we do provide. Um, I'll therefore asking Cabinet to um, authorise this so that we can start using it as from next month. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hawkins. I think Councillor John Williams is going to second this. Yes, I, I'm happy to second, although I would ask, um, Leader, that um, with regard to paragraph 15, on page 58, uh, where we refer to um, officers having a discretion with regard to charities. I would also like to see parish councils included in that as well, please. Okay. Thank you, and I would I would too. So that's so we'll put that in there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think this is an excellent bit of work. My thanks go to Andrew Jennings, who I gather is uh, our officer responsible. Yeah for putting this together. So uh, so excellent, excellent piece of work. Um, having a having a really outstanding pre-application service available is what our our ambition is. It makes planning just go so much more smoothly and it's what applicants applicants want. They want clarity uh, from the outset. It takes the guesswork out out of planning. And so uh, it is very, very important to me, me personally, that we have a really, really exemplary service on offer here, which is, you know, value, value for money, but, but worth paying for because it is such good quality. Uh, so uh, is there anyone else on cabinet who'd like to speak on this? Uh, Councillor MacDonald. Thank you. Just, just very briefly, Leader. Um, I do appreciate from a business perspective that the discount uh, for smaller businesses continues. Uh, that's so important in the environment that we're in right now. So thank you to officers and thank you for, to, to me for in, uh, continuing to include that. 
OK, uh, is there anybody else would like to speak? Anybody other than cabinet members? No, there you are, Andrew, you've done such a good, good piece of work here. Nobody's got any que any questions to ask, ask about it. Um, Ready ho, so the recommendation is um, it's recommended that the cabinet recommend to the lead cabinet member of planning to agree the proposals for the uh, Cambridge City Council, South Cambridgeshire District Council to introduce the res revised pre-application service offer and charging schedule set out in this report for the South Cambridgeshire District Council area as of the 2nd of November. So that's uh, that's nice and speedy for local government. Um, so any cabinet members, uh, so, uh, do all cabinet members approve the recommendation? Agreed. Agreed. Anybody wish to vote against it? Anybody wish to abstain? Yep, marvellous. Jolly good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so uh, cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. Uh, so the date of the next cabinet meeting is scheduled to play, take place on Monday the 7th of December at 10 o'clock. Crikey, nearly Christmas. That's a bit worrying. Um, so we're now moving into the part of the meeting that I referenced at the outset. Uh, where we will have to discuss the exclusion of the press and public. Um, so this is because the next items contain information which is commercially sensitive and members of the public are advised that if Cabinet agrees to exclude the press and public, the video stream will end. So I move that the following items of business contain exempt information falling within paragraph three as set out on your agenda and the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. Uh, and I think Councillor Neil Goff is seconding that. Would you confirm, please? Yes, yeah, Rita, I'm. Thank you. Thank you. So do members agree with the proposal? Agree. agree. Agreed. Does, anyone, does anyone wish to vote against? And does anyone wish to abstain? OK, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. I therefore propose that the press and public be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following item of business in accordance with Section 100A brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972 on the grounds that if present there would be a disclosure to them of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Act brackets as amended. Is that seconded? I've second that. Thank you very much indeed. Do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Agreed. Anybody wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? Thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. So members of the public who are watching, this means that the video stream will now end. Thank you very much indeed for joining our Cabinet meeting um, and we look forward to seeing you in December. Uh, so the live stream is going to end now. Can I just confirm with uh, Liam that that's happened? And then I believe we, those people who wish to continue with the next part of the meeting,